Okay, hi. Hi. So I'm the last talk, and I know I'm between you and beer, so I'm really going to make this as quick as I can. So welcome. Today I'm going to be talking about the seven sins of open source communities. And my name is Brian Prophet. I am a manager with the Red Hat Open Source Program Office. And we're weird, um, and those of you who know people who I work with will understand that's a multi-level statement because we are weird. Um, we're also weird in the sense that we're not like other OSPOs because um, a lot of uh, open source program offices tend to focus on like making sure there are compliance issues and getting open source even started and integrated into the culture of their corporation. Red Hat, we're sort of past that point um, because we do that every day. Um, so, and, and that sounds really flippant, but it's literally true. Um, when IBM purchased us last, and it went into effect last year, they said, hey, we would love to use your contributor guidelines and give those to our developers and they could use them to, to you know, contribute to open source. And we were like, that's great. And then we were like, we never wrote them down. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not kidding. So anyway, so we're a little weird. So the point of that is we focus a lot on community health. Um, and community growth and, and making sure that communities are vibrant. We're not really as focused on open source compliance and cultural education within our, our company. There is some of that, but our main focus is on community health. One of the things that we do, and this is the subject of this talk, is that we look at things for all of our communities within Red Hat, and if somebody asks, we'll even do it outside of Red Hat. Um, and we do this by way of audits. And the sins that I'm going to be talking about are going to be the, the audits that I'm referring to um, and, and what we cover in those audits. And I want to make clear, we're not talking about the sins that you find in mythology, in the Bible, like pride, because I have my own action figure, so, you know, that, that's pride, that's bad. So we're not talking about those. We're talking about the kind of sins that are basically anything that detracts you from the mission and the health of your project. No, don't take a picture of that. That's, just, <laughs> that's all weird, man. <laughs> all right, so we're going to go. So the first sin, lack of onboarding. And if this is like 101 for all of you, then the beer is coming. Hang on. Okay. Onboarding is probably the number one thing that we look at with any project, existing or new, within Red Hat. And when we do our audit, we are focusing on that. We're trying to see how easy is it for an outsider to your community to get inside to your community. And believe it or not, a lot of projects don't always do that very well. They'll put up a really pretty flashy website and say, here's my code, and that's it. Um, there are a few things you need to do. There are three basic tenets to this. One is, tell people what your project is. Make sure that happens. The other is, tell people how is it used. Okay, and that comes into use cases, documentation, that sort of thing. And then finally, the third aspect of onboarding is how do they get it? How many of you have ever gone to a free or open source software project website not and been able to find a download link within the first two minutes? Yes. Yeah? Yeah? Come on. <laughs> let's go. Right. I mean, it should be right there. You know? And, and a, even in Red Hat, I'm like, where's, where's the download link? How do I get this? You know? Or if it's not an executable, if it's some cloud thingamajig, you know, where's my link to get to how do you install it? However you do that. So onboarding is, a, you know, not having that is a major sin that we cover on our audits. The other is nothing in writing. So this is the age old problem. Nobody wants to do documentation because documentation is boring. I understand that. But you should always write it down for your own sanity and the sanity of those who will come after you. The only time you should never write anything down is when you're maybe telling that girl next to you in second grade that you like her. Um, never write that down. I may have experience in that. Just saying. Okay, but that's it. 
that's the only time. You should write everything down because keeping your um, um, project healthy and the continuity of your project going is a key part of that and that is where documentation comes in. Um, and not just the how-to documentation. Write down what your governance model is. What, write down what your process workflows are. You don't have to write a novel, okay? You're not James Faulkner, okay? You, you're not Jane Austen. Just write something down. It doesn't have to be that prolific, but make sure it's accurate. Okay, the next one. Who's in charge? You don't want that to be a mystery to incoming people. They need to know, like, who, how does this whole thing work? Who do they go to if there's a problem? What person is going to handle these commits? What person is going to handle if I have the code of conduct issue? Okay? Leadership is a mystery. That is often hidden. Smaller projects are very guilty of this, and, and, and it's, and it's kind of hard. You don't want to slap them around, but basically, they're small. They're like, well, there's like 10 of us here. We don't know who's in charge. But it's not even really about being in charge. It's like who's doing what, okay? You want to make sure that that is well-defined somewhere in your project's documentation. No paths to success. Now, this is starting to get into areas that um, Matt was just talking about with diversity and inclusion and, and people not knowing how to advance in the project. What does it take for me as a lone, you know, new co contributor to become a committer someday? Or to be, you know, part, if there's a, you know, if your project's big enough, do you have a technical committee? You know, how do I become part of that governance model? Okay, you need to kind of outline that a little bit. And I'm not saying, again, I'm not saying make bylaws like the Apache Software Foundation or Mozilla or something like that. And there, there's nothing wrong with that. Um, but I'm, you don't have to go that far, but do be explicit. Don't let people just sort of be like, oh, I don't know, you know, that is a sin. And these are things that we're looking at on the audits as well. Poor communication. So how many of you, how many people have gone to a project and not know where the developers are? Like virtually, you might know where their office is. And, yeah. <laughs> okay, yeah, that's a problem. To be a good open source project, you must communicate out in the open. Okay, and this is what I tell these projects all the time. Okay, and they'll say, yeah, but we've got a mailing list over here, or we've got a Slack channel over here, or we've got Discord over here. Great, why is it on your website? You haven't actually told anybody where to go. So if they have a cont contribution, or if they have a problem with the software, it would be really nice for them to know actually where to go. So be explicit about where your communication channels are. And if you do have communication channels, please, for the love of whatever deity you believe in or not, make sure you actually communicate out in the open. Okay? Don't, don't be untransparent, which is actually skipping ahead to another sin. But make sure you have your communication set. Lack of transparency. Ray, you and I are working together in an office. We're developing, which is total fiction because I can't code. Um, but anyway, I have a problem, okay? We're working on an open source project. I say, hey, Ray, can you look at this? I'm having a problem here. I can't quite seem to get this bug. And you, you and I will be like, yeah, you look at it. And you're very smart. And you'll say, yes, this is the solution. And you'll be nice, you won't make fun of me, and we'll get the solution done, and it's done. And I push it out into the open, and we're finished. What just happened? Was that transparent? Not really. And I bring that up as a, as a model, and that seems really nitpicky, but it happens all the time. And you have to be diligent with it. Now, something like that, Nobody's going to come down and say, you're not being open, but technically you're not being open. It's really hard to get in the mindset, especially when you're working in smaller work groups with a bunch of people who are doing what you're doing and you're coding in the same modules day in and day out, to keep those discussions private because it's faster and more efficient. It's easy for me to turn to Ray and say, hey, can you take a look at this? 
whether he's in the office or, you know, on a virtual Slack channel somewhere. Okay? So it's very important that when you have communication channels, make sure that all of your conversations are happening in the open as much as you humanly can. And be diligent about that. It's an easy trap to fall into. I fall into it all the time. Because sometimes I don't really want to have a big open discussion about something. I just want to get something done. Okay? But that's, that, that actually is another sin. That's pride again. I have to kind of ease up and let that go and get better input from other people. This spinal sin is not something we audit for yet. Because as Matt was saying earlier, um, this gets into things like diversity and inclusion and neurodiversity and understanding the differences in others. And we don't have a lot of metrics here yet. So this is the only part of the slides and my presentation that are not included in the audits that we do within Red Hat OSCO because it is very subjective. But I always like to stick this point in because it is super important. We have to try when we put forth our best efforts with the communities with which we work to see ourselves and others. I'm not saying don't be arrogant enough to be like, oh, well, I have three daughters and a wife, so I understand women's issues, <laughs> right? Don't be that person. I am that person, right? I don't know nothing about being a woman. I am never going to be arrogant enough to say that, you know. I have a daughter who is African American. That does not make me qualified to understand all the issues of people of color. I have maybe a better inkling of it, but it's not me. I don't understand. You have to see your... As, so don't, when I say see yourself in others, I say don't apply your value system to everybody else. What I'm saying is, try to put yourself in a position where you can listen and understand and not be defensive if somebody comes to you and says, hey, I'm having a problem with the way you're doing something. Okay? We've all been different. We've all been raised in different backgrounds, different locations, different nationalities. Okay, that doesn't mean we can't work together and do it well. So those are the seven sins. Um, if we have any questions, if I have any more time left, I'm to talk about the audits that we do um, and, and the effect that we have had with them in OSPO. So what's my time, Mr. Timekeeper? You have six minutes. Oh, I talked faster than I thought. All right, that's cool. Any questions? Yes? So you're auditing six points that you mentioned, right? Yes. How do you do audits for lack of transparency? So we do a lot of the lack of transparency because we're looking for instances of communications that are happening um, behind the scenes. So at Red Hat, it's a little bit easy for us because the way our model works is everything's done in the open source community. And then we're ready to, we take that code, we bring it to the downstream community um, within Red Hat and then we harden it, rebrand it and say it's Red Hat whatever. By the way, the secret to our whole branding scheme is we never come up with names for our products. We just say, oh, it's a virtualization product. It's Red Hat virtualization. You know? <laughs> no, it, it, go back and look at our catalog. You, you'll see I'm right. But anyway, what I'm trying to do there what we're looking for is we don't want the developers who I know are working on the downstream to like having conversations on the in internal lists about the upstream projects. So for me it's a little easy because I know where they're all working. So if I see conversations about the upstream project in a downstream list or channel, we're going to have a conversation. And we're going to say, you know, y'all, get up there and, and, and do it in the upstream. And it happens occasionally because, again, nobody's being malicious. It's just easy to do. You're there, you're talking to each other and say, oh, yeah, we found this bug. We should just fix it up in the upstream. And let's do the patch now. Well, as soon as you said we should fix it, you should have continued the conversation in the upstream channel. So that's how we, that's how we look for lack of transparency. So, yeah, yes, Justin. I'm curious what you think about diversity-related events 
for activities at open source conferences as a way of measuring not seeing ourselves in others. To give maybe a little bit of context to that, some things that we've trialed in some of the, like, the Fedora community and other communities are things like speaking a native language hour and doing things like the candy swap, where we have these experiences to get to know people in our community that aren't in a technology context. Something that I've been thinking about, but I was curious what you think. Well, it's kind of no, it's no, it's cool. Um, so what I think is yes to all of that, and and that's why I was excited about what Matt was bringing up. The thing is, OSPO is not necessarily focused on things at the event level because we have an outstanding events team at Red Hat that is helping us with that. And I know Fedora is a little bit um, different, but uh, Fedora is large enough and mature enough that they handle their own events themselves. And OSPO doesn't take away from that. So I'm not trying to dodge the question. It's mostly that we really don't focus on the event level other than to say, yes, we need a code of conduct and yes, we need to you know, have diversity and inclusion. But we're not using that as a marker for individual projects yet because most of the projects, Fedora notwithstanding, don't, aren't big enough to have their own events yet. I mean, you're talking Fedora, you're talking CentOS, which is having one down the street right now, and Overt used to, and RDO, but that's part of OpenStack. So it's not really a thing that we worry about because it doesn't really happen very often. So, but in spirit and everything and everything else, I totally agree with all those efforts, and I think they're, they're important. There a question in the middle? Yes. Okay, so at the beginning of every year, there are projects that OSPO are directly responsible for. They're on my list. And then I put out a blanket all call for any other community. Because some of the communities in Red Hat are managed by the business units, like Ansible. They're not part of OSPO. They, we bought them. They came in. They have their own community structure there. But I will say, hey, do you want to you want to do this? And if they say yes, I'll schedule it. And then the actual physical process is I have a long checklist um, that, I, that puts this out in a much more robust form. Um, and, and we just go through it. Uh, we score on individual points. Some of it is based on things that we found already working with chaos. Some of it are things that we built ourselves. And then we put that all together and give them a report. And it looks like I'm done. Yes, thank I you am. very much. You get my hat. You get your hat. Uh, thank you.